Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, so my name is Alexandra Wicks, and I'm the president of the Grenfell Campus Student Union. Um, <laughs> at, what we do as the student union is we advocate for students um, from the uh, local level here at Grenfell Campus as well as at a national level. Um, so we thought it would be really important to have a, a forum here as uh, as a university because um, considering Grenfell is such a key piece of Cornerbrook, having a good community for students is crucial. Um, so thank you all for coming out and uh, have a great evening. And I'll pass the mic over to Dr. Ivan Emke. Um, he will be our mediator, mediator for tonight's event. Thank you. I don't know if you use that term mediator to imply anything here, but uh, welcome on behalf of uh, Memorial University and the Grenfell campus. Welcome to our campus. Uh, we love this place. We come here uh, five days a week, sometimes six, and uh, enjoy the environment. And it's great to see members of the community here as well. <laughs> Last, was it at night or the night before in St. John's, they had 32 councillors running and they had 17 who showed up. We have 18 councillors running. We have 16 here, another one might be on the way. One is doing a parent-teacher night tonight just down the road. Uh, so, good on us. All right, now I'm, I'm walking around because I'm trying to get my steps in today. Uh, I got the 10,000 steps, so, uh, so I hope it doesn't throw you off if I'm going back and forth like this. Uh, I think what we need to do, first of all, is municipal politics, I understand, I've never been in it, is a bit of a thankless job. People already told you this, right? You're, you're not going to just sort of walk out right now. Thankless job, but it's a necessary thing. Of all the things that affect our quality of life every day, sometimes it's things that are in the municipal portfolio which affect it the most. And the fact that we've got 18 people running for council, two people running for mayor, I think we need to give them, don't do it yet, a really big hand of applause for running and then for being here. So if you don't give them enough applause right now, I'm just going to keep going with it like this is a, like a Jerry Springer show <laughs> until you give them enough. So let's really let it out. <laughs> there, now if you don't win, at least you've had a big applause. So uh, it's all happy. I really am tempted to point out that uh, we're here at Grenfell Campus. We work closely with the College of the North Atlantic, with Academy Canada. If you put those together, all the students, faculty, staff, researchers, uh, uh, even administrators like myself, together you'd have about 3,000 people and you'd be hard put to find very many other industries in this region that are as important. I'm tempted to say that because there are so many people here tonight who may well be in government next week at this time. So I'll try to avoid saying that. I'll try to avoid saying that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, the format for tonight, we have uh, the councillors who will go first. They each have 90 seconds to give their elevator speech. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a long elevator. It's one of the ones that it's broken down right now, just uh, in, the, in the main building. But it's maybe a short elevator if you've been practicing this for a while. And I want to first of all apologize to each and every one of you for the fact that I will be fascistic in my timekeeping because I'm forced to. Because it's, to be fair to everybody, if I cut you off, you'll say, that guy, he was like, he was unfair. Like, but if I cut your fellow counselors off or potential counselors off, you'll say, yeah, he, was, he, he kept the time, it was okay. So I know I'll be loved by some and hated by others. But I could say, just when it comes to 90 seconds, finish your thought but that could take another 90 seconds, right? Like we're here at the university where we speak sentences that are often 90 seconds long or sometimes longer. In fact, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> so each counselor will choose them and I have this little basket, the official council choosing basket and, uh, and I'll choose your name. I'll also choose who is on deck 
kind of like a, a diving competition, you know, so you're ready. So you'll have 90 seconds to sweat or whatever it is. And the 90 seconds start when you get up here and there's actually a timekeeper there that will help or hinder you depending on whether you like to watch the seconds tick away of your life. Anyway. Um, so we won't start until, until you're up here um, and it'll all be random. I think, is, is, that, is that okay? Is that, everybody is okay with that? So I will, um, what I'll do, the, I mentioned that one candidate couldn't be here because he's working. So he sent a short note. So I'll pick who the first person to speak who's here will be, and then I'll read his, and then you will get 90 seconds to prepare. So it's entirely fair, okay? I'm trying to be that way. And if I get cut off, uh, you, they're going to cut me off if I go beyond 90 seconds. I should mention, fortunately, I've got people in the crowd telling me what to do, um, that there are pieces of paper on your tables there, and there are pens. Uh, and these, I hope you haven't been using to write poetry or anything like that, because there's another use for them here. If you have a question for the mayoral candidates, please write it down on that piece of paper or that, or if you need, I have several questions, or we have lots of paper here and then we'll pass them over to the end. So when we come to the mayoral candidate section, some of the questions that we ask will be chosen from that. We want to find questions that are quite a clustered, like a number of you will have the very same questions. So it's your way to participate in this. All right, so the first person who's going to speak after I give the little regrets here is Lenny Benoit. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Von Grander wanted to say, uh, to pass on his regrets. Unfortunately, he's unable to be here tonight. He said, I am carrying out my professional duties as an educator at Cornerbrook Regional High on this very evening. We are having our curriculum night with parents as well as meeting new parents, guardians for the first time. As was the case when I was MHA, I met with members of Grenfell Campus Student Council on many occasions. If elected to Cornerbrook City Council, I extend the same courtesy and assure that everyone that my door will always be open to discuss issues and opportunities of importance at any time. So that's from Vaughn Granter. After Lenny, we'll have Bern Staben. So Lenny, come on up whenever you're ready. As a professional communicator, this is <coughs> scary, right? I just think if I start really fast, I can beat the clock. <laughs> I'm ready. Good evening, everyone, and good evening to all the candidates. Great to see such a, a large group, a large, diverse group wanting to represent this city. Very proud of all of you for, for stepping forward. Uh, my name is Lenny Benoit. I've been in the city of Cornerbrook for 30 years, and in that time, I've worked with CFCB and VOCM. Uh, my job and volunteer work have given me what I think is a pretty unique perspective on uh, what this city wants. The people I've spoken with, they've told me their needs, their desires, their wants, their pride in this city. And that's what I want to bring the council, that pride of community, the desire to make the city the best it can be. Some issues, we need improvements to some of our sports infrastructure in the city to realize their full potential. Better facilities create better opportunities for a healthier community. And quite frankly, for economic opportunities as well. Better facilities, bigger tournaments, more athletes visiting, more money infused in our local economy. I'm also an advocate in investing in people. As a matter of fact, tomorrow I have a meeting with a coalition of uh, uh, groups uh, based uh, in the city to talk about social needs in the city. Education, awareness, and action is needed to offer help to those who need it the most. Fire services and public safety has also been a, a major concern in this election. I'm a, I'm a family man. I have an amazing wife and three children. I want to make sure they're taken care of. I want to make sure the people who take care of them are taken care of as well. The arts community, it needs work. We can help promote that. Thank you. And I can see I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. You set the bar high there, or low, as the case may be, 90 seconds. After uh, Byrne, we'll have Bill Griffin. So uh, Byrne is up next. Uh, the middle one there. It's better with the camera angles that way. Good evening, everyone. Great to be here. I'm Bern Staben. I've had the honor and the pleasure to be deputy mayor of the city of Cornerbrook for the last four years. 
I've been, I'm a retired pharmacist, and my career has allowed me to get to know many of you, to serve you, and to know and understand what your needs are as residents. I've also had the opportunity then, in that particular case, to run my own business. So I would bring my financial expertise to the city, which I think I hopefully you feel I've done. Uh, my s career as a volunteer, I've been uh, chair of Western Healthcare Corporation for five years, chair of the Hospital Foundation, chair of the Rotary Music Festival for 12 years, too many for some of you anyway. So as a counselor, I just need to say this that whatever successes I brought to the table, and hopefully you feel there were some, uh, I just need to remind all of you here collectively that my success is not mine alone, it's our council's success, and I hope that you feel that we've had four good years. As Chair of Finance and, and Administration, I mean balancing the city's budget has been a key component, and we've managed to hand, have uh, a handle on our taxes and to work and foster a good relationship with our employees. One of the things that I can say that I've always preached for the last four years, I wanted the city of Cornerbrook to be an employer of choice where we foster good relationship with our staff and we can maximize their true potential. I think Excellent. that's essential to happiness. So thank, thank you. you, Ivan. Thank I had lots more, but that's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> We have occupational health and safety rules here. Anyway, uh, after Bill, we're going to have uh, Katrina Basha. So Bill, okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, first of all, my phone is not working, so I'm gonna to have to wing it. Okay, uh, my name is Bill Griffin. Uh, I'm a retired deputy chief with the Cornbrook Fire Department. I worked there for 32 years. Uh, very proud member of that department. I've lived in Cornerbrook in the curling area all my life. I have three kids and, my, and, a, and a wife, and we love it here and we want to stay here. And I want to keep my grandkids here too as well. Um, my thing with the, uh, I think the biggest thing for me with, the, uh, with council, uh, it all, to me it all revolves around spending. And I think spending is, is something that, uh, it's so important really because I, th I think you, uh, my, my philosophy is you run, you run the city like you run your home. And uh, you know, you can't spend the 20, $20 if you only make it to 10. You know, like the challenge to me as a counselor would be to find out ways to, to make that $10 work and to address all the issues. I think we have to look around and find what needs to be done and treat everybody equally. Again, the biggest challenge I had as a firefighter, my world was all around red trucks. But for me as a counselor, then there's more departments in the city than just fire. And uh, th that's, that's different for me. But I, I uh, welcome the challenge, and uh, I think I can, uh, I, I have a good relationship, I, I, I can work with people, and I think that's probably one, one of my strongest assets. I can get along, and I know what's best, and uh, that's my goal, I want to serve. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Bill. <laughs> After Katrina, it's Linda, Jason. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Katrina Basha, and I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. I spent 33 years of my professional life as a speech-language pathologist, assisting people with communication delays and disorders, listening to their concerns, and con counseling parents and their families. It has taught me to have a positive outlook on life, to be a team player, and to reach consensus wherever possible, and for all the right reasons. These are the qualities that I feel I will bring to council, chambers if elected. While I cannot promise that every need will be met for every resident, what I can promise is that I will represent, advocate, and debate your issues on city council. Having lived here most of my life spent in curling, I am not blind to the condition of many roads and curbsides in many neighborhoods. Nor am I blind to the needs of our youth and seniors not being fully met, nor blind to the necessity and support for small business growth. I want to be part 
of the process that makes this city even more attractive and worthy of economic development and prosperity for all citizens, while at the same time being fiscally responsible, transparent, and accountable. Thanking you in advance for your support. Best of wishes to all the candidates. Thank you. After Linda, it will be Donna Wheeler. Linda Chasson. Thanks, Ivan. Before we start, if Ivan has a problem getting these steps in, a lot of us have a few flyers we have to deliver, so we <laughs> drop them off at Ivan's. So to all the candidates, please drop off your flyers to Ivan tomorrow, he'll get these steps in, let me tell you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Linda Chasson, and thanks for the invitation to attend this debate. My priorities in this election involve demonstrating fiscal leadership because we have much infrastructure that needs to be replaced and new infrastructure that needs to be built in the next four years. As a council, I feel a new council coming up, we must continue our support for the sports organization through grants and infrastructure development. I believe the new council must also focus on the arts community and should be continuing with the financial support that we already give, the city already gives now, but develop an arts master plan to help mix it all together. But I feel as, as I guess, my, uh, my previous occupation, I feel our city needs to be made more inclusive through the establishment of an inclusive community committee with residents forming the committee. And finally, council must be more transparent and accountable. And one way for this to happen is to have all council meetings being held as public meetings with the exception of land, legal, and labor issues. Thanks for the invitation here tonight, and best of luck to all the candidates. Thank you. Thank you. You notice we don't time the jokes there. Eh? Anyway, <laughs> she was still within the 90 seconds. So after uh, Donna, we'll have Tom Stewart. Thanks, Thanks Ivan. Thanks. Hi, my name is... Oh, <laughs> ready to go? <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Donna Wheeler. I was born and raised in Cornerbrook and have lived here for most of my life. I served on city council for one term and ran for mayor in the previous election, 2013. I have three children. My husband owns a small wo mobile welding business here in the city. I'm a registered nurse and am currently employed as regional manager of health information at Western Health. I feel that the city of Cornerbrook has made progress in a number of areas over the years, but we still have outstanding issues to focus on. We have to support business growth and encourage businesses to set up in our city. New industry is key to providing jobs and expanding our tax base. Cornerbrook has a lot to offer new business, and we need to get the word out that we are welcoming new opportunities. Further, we need to support our sports groups and provide safe, clean facilities, including a new pool. A recreation master plan was completed during my term on council, and we need to continue with the recommendations from that report to keep us moving forward. While I am no stranger to the need for guidelines and regulations, I do feel that some of them at City Hall do not make good sense for a city of our size and with our geography. These one-size-fits-all regulations do not always fit and more flexibility is needed. Finally, the City of Cornerbrook still collects poll tax even though it is outdated. I feel poll tax needs to be either reformed to protect students or abolished altogether. On September 26th, I res respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Remember that if you have a question you want to ask, write that down on the piece of paper for the mayoral candidates and we'll send them across. So uh, we'll have to get them in a few minutes. So please welcome uh, Tom Stewart. And after Tom, yes, yes, we will have uh, Keith Cormier. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Stewart, and I've been an educator here in this community for the past two decades. I'm also regional director for Newfoundland Labrador Basketball Association, and I've dedicated my, my life here in Cornerbrook to the training and the growth of youth basketball in this city and the western region of this province. I'm also your former head coach for Warriors men's basketball, and I'm a small cog in a large athletics and recreation community. Athletics and recreation plays a key role in physical, social, and economic health of Cornerbrook. We need to upgrade key facilities and maximize the use of others. 
These investments in time and material not only benefit our active youth and adults, but the community as a whole. It keeps us healthy, it brings us together, and it brings others to us. I truly believe that the amateur athletics and recreation community, if properly supported by the city, can be a positive boost the city needs, both socially and economically. It's our future. I'm also here as a citizen running for the position of council, passionate about the need to rid our city of poll tax. It's inequitable. It's a burden on our working youth and lower income individuals and family. It harkens back to a former way of doing things, a method of taxation that no other democratic institution applies and long since abandoned by the British system our poll tax dutifully emulates. Nothing epitomizes more, in my opinion, our hold on old policies, old ways of thinking, as does our poll tax. I believe a city's environment is a reflection upon its pride as a whole. I'm going to be kicked, so I'm going to say I bring to you reasonable concerns that if addressed, and can give you realistic, positive results. <laughs> Remember to do those questions, because we have to have some questions if we're going to have a mayoral uh, candidates up here. So uh, send them off to the side. After Keith, we're going to have Priscilla Butcher. Thank you, Ivan. Well, who's Keith Cormier? Some people know me, some people don't. Um, as far as I can trace back, on my father's side, I'm a sixth generation person living here in the Bay of Islands. Uh, our family on, the, on our Mi'kmaq side was here when Cook came in in the late 1700s. So we've been around a long, long time here in Cornerbrook. Okay. But uh, my platform is on my brochure, and, but I really came here tonight because I really want to speak to the students. Because you're the ones who are going to be taken over not too far down the road. And there's a train that's left the station many, many years ago called climate change. And we have to address it as a municipality, as a province, as a nation, and as a country. And there are leaders in this, in this world that don't believe in it. But I will tell you that the climate change scientists, and this is for the students here, and for the parents of students, the climate change scientists tell us that by 2050, the temperature in Cornwall is going to be 2.2 degrees warmer Celsius. Now, I haven't got to tell you, if you're living on Shamrock Crescent, that don't mean rain in February. So how are we going to manage the infrastructure for the next 50, 60 years to manage the snow in the wintertime and manage the rain and the runoff in the, in the summertime? We're going to get a lot more rain. There's going to be a lot more snow. So if you're in doing civil tech, consider becoming a civil engineer. Municipalities around this province are going to need you down the road to help manage the infrastructure in their communities. That's just a thought to everyone else in this room. Thank you. Thanks very much. How are you doing? Yeah, send the questions over and uh, Marilyn will, will pick them up. And uh, after uh, Priscilla, we'll have uh, Devin Party. So, Priscilla. Hi, my name is Priscilla Butcher, and I'm a candidate for councillor in the city of Cornerbrook in the upcoming election. Over the past years, I have served as mayor, deputy mayor, and councillor, and I have been involved and still involved in many volunteer organizations. During my service, I have demonstrated that I am reliable, dependable, and accessible to the people, and have the ability to work successfully as a team member and a leader. We have many economic opportunities existing in our city, but we need to develop better partnerships and build, and build on what we have. Our education facilities, our port, our industrial parks, and our business sector all have opportunities for growth. To be successful in, addre in addressing these issues, council needs to have fresh ideas and past experience, and I can give that mixture both. I can bring sound rational judgment to the table. I am fortunate to be in a position to devote full time and energy to getting this job done and being a strong advocate on your behalf. I ask for your support in working for the betterment of the city as a member of the new council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And after uh, Devin, we'll have uh, Leo Bruce. So please welcome to the podium, Devin Party. What is leadership? Leadership is inspiring those around you to do more, 
and become better. Leadership is helping people create a vision and then motivating them to achieve that vision. Leadership is about inspiring new ideas and then enabling people to achieve new goals. My name is Devin Parity, and I'm ready to bring my leadership skills to the city of Cornerbrook and put them to work for you, my fellow residents. I've been a member of the Canadian Armed Forces for over five years. I've traveled all over Canada and internationally to represent the forces. I'm currently finishing my third year of civil engineering technology, and I just completed a work term with the engineering department at City Hall. I believe that I have both the experience and the passion that is needed to provide a motivated and informed decision on our city council. We need councillors who will promote better communication structures between departments, businesses and residents in our community. We need councillors who aren't going to make false promises just to get elected. But most of all, we need councillors who will promote strong community involvement and a newfound pride in our beautiful city. On September 26th, I ask you to get out and vote and vote Devon Party for City Council. Thank you. It's almost magical. One person asks for civil engineering and then somebody comes up. You know, so. <laughs> After Leo Bruce, it'll be Brian Sparks. Leo. Good evening, everybody. My name is Leo Bruce. I'm a retired financial advisor. The big issue in this election is jobs. The Athic Energy want to come here and create 600 jobs in our Cornerbrook waterfront. Can you imagine what that would do to our Cornerbrook economy? Our children down the road when they finish their education would have options of staying in the city instead of having to go to Fort McMurray or anywhere else in the country. This could be the biggest thing since Bowater came here 60, 70 years ago and built their mill. Secondly, health care. We have too many people in the city who don't have a doctor. This day and age, this is unacceptable. Recently, Cape Breton ran a, a committee with business community, city council, and Cape Breton Health. They came up with a strategy where they recruited 16 doctors, 12 specialists, and four family doctors. That's thinking outside the box. That's what we have to do. Also, I recommend we put in a business fast track for businesses that are looking to expand or build new buildings. There's too much time being held on permitting at City Hall for people trying to expand and grow their businesses. Fast track business would be a great thing and give our business community the confidence that they need to thrive in the city. On September 26, please vote Leo Bruce. I'd love to go back to City Hall and bring my financial advisor skills back to City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you have all, if you have any more questions, uh, I think they're going to start compiling them. So uh, send them across to the end. We'll, we'll, we'll get them. But after uh, Brian Sparks, Maureen Many. So. Brian Sparks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Sparks. Uh, a lot of you may know I am a longtime resident of Cornerbrook. Uh, married with two children, married to the same woman for 27 years. Uh, I am of uh, Mi'kmaq descent. Uh, very proud of that. Uh, my mother was a longtime advocate for uh, the Native movement in Cornerbrook. She started the Cornerbrook Indian Band in 1970, and our family has been a great part of that movement through the years. Um, I'm a small business owner in Cornerbrook, been self-employed for, I've been at the same line of work for almost 33 years. And uh, as a business owner, you see some of the things that go on in the city, especially when it comes to red tape, that you don't like. I've seen a lot of things have to move outside the city because they just couldn't deal with the city of Cornerbrook and other heads of the departments. They just couldn't seem to get things done. So as a small business owner, I think I can help with that. Cornerbrook needs business and residential expansion to help bring in new revenues. We need to have access to necessary, necessary programs, um, uh, such as uh, the um, Jubilee Field, 
a uh, new project. They want uh, infrastructure there. They need it desperately. Uh, the new pool, which I'd love to see happen, but uh, that takes a lot of uh, time, money, resources, and uh, thanks very much. I guess that's it for me because Simon Cowell is here <laughs> shifting me up. <laughs> I thought we were going to do a duet there for a minute. I was getting ready. So after Maureen Many, we'll have Pamela Gill. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maureen Manny. I was born 3,727 kilometers northeast of Cornerbrook. That is my ancestral home. Cornerbrook is my real home and has been for most of my 30 years in 50 years in Canada. I want to see a council that's imaginative, <coughs> modern, vibrant, and also careful with the funds. After all, I am Scottish. <laughs> I hope to encourage the building of a downtown core which is bright, clean, and no empty stores. But of course, the businesses have to take part in that. If it doesn't already exist, I think a sh law should be passed that three months vacancy is the limit on a building or a store. After that, it should be rented to local entrepreneurs for a nominal cost better some cash than none, another Scottish quirk. <laughs> These empty premises are a blight on our city and lowering the value of everything around them. I want to see a waterfront that's teeming with business opportunities. We have an empty harbour, a council who cares for the welfare of the more unfortunate citizens and not dismissing them. I hope to see a talented council of all ages, work as a team to make these things happen and more. I would be honored to be part of that team when I see him coming. I have the energy, time, and patience, and these are a great group of people to do it. <laughs> Thank you. This is like Chase the Ace. Man, we're getting down. So after Pamela Gill, it'll be Kyle Brookings. Thank you. Okay, go. Thanks to the GCSU and Go Engagement for inviting me here this evening. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Pamela Gill, and I wasn't born here, but I choose to live here. I've been here for 23 years. Much to my mother's chagrin, she keeps trying to get me to go back to the Sin City, but I won't leave because I didn't know I could get a tan until I lived here. <laughs> Uh, all of the points that have been made so far, I'm supportive of every single one of them. Uh, whether it's recreation, business, social issues, health, arts, uh, environment, uh, litter. Everyone knows that litter is near and dear to my heart. But I want to talk to you tonight about the people that I've met while I've been canvassing. Because had I not taken on this uh, challenge, I would never have met these people. And I think their stories are really important. There's one person I met who was waiting for four months for a business permit to operate in Cornerbrook. There's a gentleman and others in his neighborhood that live on Walburns Road, which is not paved, and nearly took the bottom out of my car when I was trying to get to his house to speak to him. I met a woman on Reed Street who's a shut-in and has no one. She's paralyzed on one side, and she fell down recently and broke the fingers in her left hand. It took her five minutes to get to the door. I watched her struggle through the glass as she was trying to come to the door and answer it. And I met a family that owns a double lot in Cornerbrook in one of the richest neighborhoods, and they uh, can't get a permit to build a shed on their second lot. I want to help these people. I listen, I care, and I get stuff done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your good-naturedness in my um, getting you off. So after Kyle, we have uh, Josh Carey. Thanks.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kyle Brookings, and uh, I've been a resident of Corner Brook uh, for four and a half years now. I've made this place my home. Uh, since coming here, um, I worked my way up through the ranks. I'm a second lieutenant with the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, I'm also, uh, I also work at the Bank of Montreal as well. Uh, some of the things that I want to do to make this place better is uh, I want to do our very best to ensure that we can get new businesses approved as quickly as possible. I think Cornerbrook has a real problem with getting new businesses, and I think we need to work together as a team to get that done. I propose that we cut business tax for new and existing businesses. I think this will be a short-term loss that will add up to a long-term gain. I also want to see what we can do to expand our transit system. And also, I want to work on getting the population up in Cornerbrook. We have three post-secondary institutions here, but unfortunately, once people are done their program of study, nine times out of ten, they have to leave the city. There's no trouble getting people here, there's trouble keeping people here, and I think that needs to be fixed. I also want to eliminate the poll tax. As many uh, other uh, councillor candidates mentioned, the poll tax is something that has been eliminated by many other municipalities, not only here in Canada, but across the, uh, across the globe. And if I am elected to council, I promise to work to get these things completed. Additionally, uh, we all know that we have more than enough potholes here. Uh, I want to see what we can do to create some kind of uh, online and telephone pothole alert system. On my road in Cornerbrook, we have had... Um, I know, I've got, I've got to go. Too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you should have been in the Goulds a couple of weeks ago. You got the last uh, ace, so please welcome Josh Carey. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Whenever you're ready. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and fellow candidates. My name is Josh Carey, and I'm excited to offer myself for re-election to Cornerbrook City Council. Cornerbrook is a magnificent city. Its natural beauty, world-class recreational facilities, educational institutions, and overall livability are the attributes that make our city a superb place to live and raise a family. Cornerbrook is not unlike other communities. We are facing similar challenges. Responding to these challenges requires a shared vision. It is about utilizing our assets to the greatest potential to create economic development. With three post-secondary institutions, Western Health, a deep water port, and several major industries all headquartered in our city, I believe Cornerbrook has tremendous opportunity. I believe your council must work with our educational institutions and industry to develop a strategy establishing Cornerbrook as an advanced technology hub focused on the environment and natural resources. We must encourage business, industry and economic development groups to establish a business culture within City Hall. Council must create an environment to encourage our young people to stay and want to build a life in our city. We have a strong community culture a strong arts community, and an abundance of recreational facilities. These are the issues that I would like to discuss at City Hall. On September the 26th, I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. We need to thank all of these candidates for giving us some succinct idea of their platform. So uh, let's see if you can clap just slightly louder than you did earlier. You were okay, but it was a little bit Presbyterian. <laughs> and may the best eight of you win. Oh, there's only six. That's, that's why my vote never gets counted. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, there, you might have noticed there are some media in the room. So we're very pleased to have uh, just about all the media in the city here, that if something happens somewhere else, we're out of luck to find out about it. So uh, we have uh, the Western Star, we have NTV. Uh, we are live streaming this on YouTube. It's some of the interweb kind of thing. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, so we're live streaming on that. Bay of Islands Radio is live broadcasting this on uh, Bay of Islands Radio, which will soon be an FM. Oh dear, that's sort of I'm adding a little bit of editorial content, but we also have Rogers. Rogers is going to replay this tomorrow night at 7 p.m. and continue to replay it until the next election. Is that right? <laughs> is, 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 yeah. <laughs> They're really working for programming, you know, so it's just, local content, but they're going to replay it for 
Well, you said all weekend, off and on. So, um, so there's lots of ways that you can hear this again or see it again or you'll hear about it. So we're very pleased to have it. Okay, so the next thing, I, oh, I also want to mention that some of the candidates have left literature out there. And one of the advantages of this event is that you'll be able to ask your question of all of the council candidates after this is over. So please uh, hang around and ask them some questions with coffee and tea and so on and pick up some literature because that's a real advantage. You can also ask the mayoral candidates as well, which we're going to start. So we have six questions and two of them were put together by the GCSU, which, uh, uh, which is, is uh, co-sponsor of all of this, or sponsor of this, and so they have asked a couple of questions which are not at all limited to students because they relate to issues that affect everybody. The other four questions are questions that will come that those people back in the, in the, uh, in the back room there, Laura and, uh, and Marilyn, are working on. So for each question, I'll ask the question, and uh, one of the mayoral candidates has two minutes to uh, have a response to it. The second candidate has two minutes. Then the first candidate, once again, has one minute to rebut or clarify or enlighten, and then the other candidate gets one minute. So we'll go back and forth, and we'll change who goes first uh, each time. So in order to decide who goes first the first time, Dawn, pick a number between one and 10. So Jim Parsons will go first the first time. There's a real important kind of, it's very difficult mathematical formula for how I came up with that. <laughs> but it was, if the number was between six and 10, it's Jim, between one and five, it's Charles. So uh, I could have told you that in advance, but he would have then been the one to choose who goes first, first. But since there are six questions, everybody gets to go first three times and go last three times. So is that okay? Are, we, are, you, are you okay? Like you've just sat through 15 or 16 90 second commercials. <laughs> so uh, you're all doing pretty well. So okay, let's have, uh, and, and uh, there needs to be, while they come down, let's just for the television cameras and stuff like that, a big hand for Charles Pender and, <laughs> and Jim Parsons. We, get, we do have water down here, yep, thanks. Oh, there's a bit of water in there somewhere? There is water, we'll get you some water. Oh my goodness. Uh, this is... This water I can't take credit for that yet, can I? Do we have a glass that we can... Oh, oh here it is, yep, you can use this one. I never even drank out of it, honestly. It's the best water in Atlantic Canada, I said. It is, and I don't know why you don't just have bottles of water, you know, and just say, Cornerbrook City Water, you know, but anyways, we, we like this one. So, the first question, so you guys okay? You're, uh, you understand yeah, sure. how, what we're going to do? I'll just, uh, you can just turn that mic off at some point, I guess, because I'm using this, because I'm trying to get my steps. So the first question is answered first by Jim. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if elected as mayor, how would you reinvest and improve Cornerbrook City Transit? What are some obvious changes you feel need to be made to the service? And so we'll start the clock for okay. you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Thank uh, GCSU and uh, Go Engagement for having us here. Uh, I think debate is very important. I'm glad to uh, glad to be here. Uh, transit. Transit has come up a lot. Uh, I've been spending the last few months uh, going out talking to community members, and uh, I've talked to uh, transit users, of course, uh, drivers. Uh, I've talked to community groups, uh, students as well, and transit is essential. We have to have transit. Uh, it services a very important sector. Low-income individuals and students are primary users, of course, but we also have seniors using it. Transit has been deemed ineffective by a whole segment of our community. Uh, it's been written off by a lot of people. Ridership does not improve. And um, there's a couple ways to approach it. One way is to throw it all out and start from scratch, but I don't believe that's the solution. Uh, I believe in incremental improvement of transit. Um, we have a number of problems, of course, things like uh, scheduling problems, route problems, um, and the timing of when it's available, weekends and evenings. Uh, so m my approach would be to uh, take an incremental improvement, build in a regular sort of assessment period and uh, a period to change, make small changes 
to transit so that it better serves the schedules of students, doesn't arrive like five, five minutes after class, say, uh, and it, it gets you around town efficiently. So uh, that's my take on transit. Thanks, Jim. Um, just before we start, I can't see the time. Yeah. Oh, you can't see the time. Okay. <laughs> Maureen, uh, you could move to the right or left. <laughs> <laughs> move, no. move to the left. Yeah, it's always say, better. Right? Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I think we're good now. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks. Yeah. Like Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Do you want me to ask the question again? Or are you yeah, okay? sure. Okay, so if elected as mayor, how would you reinvest and improve Cornerbrook City Transit? What are some obvious changes you feel need to be made to the service? Yeah. Thank you. So I've always been a big uh, believer in transit. Uh, my father actually ran a jitney in the back in the 50s, if anybody remembers those things. And everywhere we travel, obviously, we take transit, public transit, subways, buses, and so on. So I've always believed in transit. I'm a big supporter of transit. And, uh, you know, when I was a student here at Grenfell, I always took the bus to come to class and actually arrived on time. We had the big city buses. But uh, by 1997, those buses had uh, outlived their use, and successive councils decided to, you know, tender it out and get uh, smaller buses and so on. Buses that right now are not suitable to the needs of our citizens. Uh, the previous council did do a study. They reduced some of the services and time and so on because the buses were not really being used as they could be used. Uh, we have an opportunity now in the fall with a feasibility study being planned for users to, uh, I guess, inform the city what they would like to see. We could look at larger buses that could pick up and drop off larger numbers of people going to, say, a hospital, a, a school, uh, a high school. Uh, there are a number of students in this who live within 1.6 kilometers of a junior high or a senior high school who can't get a school bus. Uh, how do they get to their activities after school and so on? So there's opportunities there. We can look at uh, smaller hop-on, uh, hop-off go buses in the lower part of the city in the downtown for people to get across town quickly. There are all kinds of options that you can look at. One of the things we have to realize is that uh, as one of two communities in the province that has a transit system, we can also access the federal transit funds. Those funds are in the billions of dollars. So depending on our population and the usage that we have right now, we can access those funds for a, a new transit system. So a feasibility study will tell us how big the transit system should be, what routes we should be on, Accessible buses for both uh, people with accessibility issues and people with baby carriages and so on uh, that they can use. There's also an opportunity to expand our service to a large area of the city and ensure that people, especially in the winter who are nervous about driving, can get out, they can go to shopping malls, we can pick up people in seniors homes and bring them to the places they need to congregate. So there's lots of opportunities there. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, a minute. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, transit is, uh, is uh, we have to have it. I mean, there is no uh, alternative. We can't, uh, we, scrapping it is not an option. To improve it, I think we've done enough with studies. I think we're wasting our money and our time doing more consulting reports, to tell you the truth. Uh, I've spoke with one individual who actually worked at City Hall for a summer studying transit. And uh, there were a number of small incremental improvements that could have been made uh, things like changing the schedule just slightly, uh, bringing it to areas of the city where it might actually get more use, some of the more low-income neighborhoods of our city, for example. Um, I think we could also look at using it for special events. Let's introduce people to transit. So when we have something down on the waterfront, potentially, or a big concert someday, let's start using the bus to get people there. Um, I can't really see the timer, but uh, no, that's okay. This time you're in the way, yeah, Brian. Um, but that's, a, yeah, that's all I have right there. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's Thanks. fine. We have to work on that uh, timer know. thing there. Um, Charles. You're trying Good. it, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, my experience tells me that in dealing with federal and provincial funding agencies, in order to access funding, generally they want you to have a feasibility study. They want to know that you've thought about how you're going to do these things and you're just not going to take money and spend it. So they want to make sure you have a plan. They want to make sure it's well laid out. They want to make sure the involvement of all groups in the community that would be used the transit system before you go ahead, purchase new buses or lay out new designs or not purchase new buses, whatever you're going to do. Uh, we use the city buses now uh, regularly, for instance, uh, usually at the beginning of the year we have free uh, transit days uh, on environmental days, awareness days and so on. When we have events around the city like intergenerational days, uh, we use the city buses to pick up seniors from the seniors homes at Loans Complex and Mountain View. So we actually do use the city buses around the city uh, quite frequently for special events. Uh, there are other opportunities to use them to bring people to other events that we could have uh, throughout the city. So there's lots of uh, opportunity to do those things, and that's the things that we need to hear from our residents to tell us what are those needs and what we should be doing. Excellent. Thanks. Have a big, big hand for this first question.
All right. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, I'll just uh, bring it out here. And you can pass it around there. Yeah, good. Oh, it's not water. Share. It's, oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That was, that was for the mayoral candidates. That's the vodka. Yeah, that's right. Anyway. Ivan special aquavit. Right. <laughs> oh, there no. you go. <laughs> so the next question uh, is, you know, start, Charles, you get to start. Sure. Two minutes. And then Jim, two minutes. Charles with one. Jim with one. So with an increase in international student population at Grenfell Campus and new Canadians coming to the Cornerbrook area, how well do you feel the city of Cornerbrook is performing with providing support and services for our new citizens? What are some changes you feel need to be made? So one of the big uh, issues we have, of course, when we have new citizens coming in is making them feel welcome and comfortable. Uh, students and, and others that come here to work, whether it's university, hospital, and so on. Uh, so it's always an issue to not only attract but retain uh, uh, new people in our community. Uh, some of that is cultural, some of that is people just coming here to study and leave. Uh, sometimes they leave because there are family issues where we have one person working, a specialist maybe, and their family don't feel comfortable here and, and so on. So there's all kinds of issues there. Uh, we've been fairly successful in retaining uh, populations from uh, during certain times, I guess, uh, from after the Second World War and so on. Our deputy mayor uh, is, is one uh, living example of that, I guess, and some of our business owners on Broadway and so on. Uh, we are now working with with uh, uh, many uh, groups in the community and uh, we're working with the Association for New Canadians, the Cornerbrook uh, uh, Greater Board of Trade, the city, the uh, hospital and Grenfell campus to look at because those are the populations or organizations that uh, attract uh, highly qualified personnel, students and others that would come here to either work or study and then want to stay. So we're working on that with these organizations. The, um, the Atlantic Premiers also have uh, a strategy to attract and maintain and retain uh, new Canadians in Atlantic Canada. But so far, none of the Atlantic provinces have had much success. I want to uh, work with the federal government. They have some funding available to look at setting up an association for new Canadians here in Cornerbrook, either as a working with the group out of St. John's or our own, uh, working with a community group that would be representative of the organizations that are apt to bring in uh, and, uh, I guess, invite uh, workers and students and so on into our community and work with them to look at how we maintain, how we retain uh, immigrants into our community, looking at issues such as cultural uh, differences, integration, uh, language issues. Uh, we do have a language lab here uh, for, for people who want to learn English as a second language. So there's lots of opportunities out there that we could be working on, and we're doing it. Thanks, Charles. Um, Jim, do you want the question repeated? Sure, yeah. Okay. With an increase in international student population at Grenfell Campus and new Canadians to Cornerbrook area, how well do you feel the city of Cornerbrook is performing with providing support and services for these new citizens? What are some changes you feel need to be made? Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, I want to say, um, I want to recognize how important it is for us to attract uh, Im immigrants to this city, and international students are a big part of that. Um, my partner is uh, the manager of recruitment here at Grenfell. Uh, we, we actually moved to Cornerbrook for her to take that job. And when we moved here, there were only a handful of international students. And now, as I understand it, there's about 200. Uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, we have ESL, we have graduate students and undergraduate. Um, so we have a great opportunity. How do we keep them here? Uh, we've already talked about transit and things like that, providing services that many students need. We need affordable housing, another issue that, again, all students need. We do need to look at settlement services, and uh, I was, it was nice to be part of that recently where uh, we worked with the Board of Trade and uh, uh, the ANC to, again, work on getting a position here, potentially, to help with some of those services. I think the city has to be the connector here, and it has to get out and connect with groups like the university, like um, Western Health, and like the business community. And uh, these are three groups where uh, immigration is an important issue, and international students are part of that. Uh, so I think we can't do it alone, but we need to start building those connections. All of these groups have something to say and something to learn, uh, something we can learn from. Um, the, a lot of the same issues that are faced by uh, people who are immigrating here to work in some of our service sector jobs are some of the same issues faced by international students. So um, I think we need to take a more collaborative approach with all parts of our community. Uh, and uh, that's how we can make uh, life better and hopefully retain a number of these valuable sort of international students that are coming here every year. Great. Thank you, Jim. Charles, you've uh, want to turn the, turn the monitor there. You move it to your left. 
There we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so the, this is something we're already doing. So I've already uh, arranged and have met with uh, the oh. hospital, Corner Book Board of Trade, uh, the DBA, uh, the Association for New Canadians, uh, other groups, the Grenfell Campus, obviously, and uh, I've reached out to our MP, Goody Hutchings, and they've reached out to Im uh, Immigration uh, Canada, looking at how not only do we attract and retain uh, new people in Cornerbrook, but also uh, working with our business community who are, uh, I guess, attracting a lot of service injury, uh, service entry uh, positions here in Cornerbrook in the service industry, and they're having difficulty as well, but there are other positions where people are spending a lot of money to try to uh, reach, attract somebody to work in the city. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. We are working with the groups that are out there. We're collaborating with everyone. It's like anything else when you start it new. It takes time and you have to learn from the people who are most, uh, I guess, closely associated with the issues. And that's one of the approaches that we've taken. Great. Excellent. Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we came here about 14 years ago, there was only a handful of international students. And now we have 200. Grenfell learned long ago that we're facing a population crisis here in Western Newfoundland. Um, our population is declining rapidly. And if we were going to have a student, maintain a student base even, of the you know, 12, well, I guess 1,400 students that we have here now, Grenfell had to change tack and start recruiting and going after international students and Canadian students. And uh, I think it's a shame that uh, as a city, we haven't done that. We haven't learned that lesson. Again, this started 14 years ago at Grenfell, looking further afield to recruit international students. Why are we just getting, uh, getting on that train of thought right now? I think it's crucial, and I think we're way behind. Thanks again to both of you. You're, you're so on time. Like, we need some new volunteers at Bay of Islands Radio, so you guys would be just great. It's the can, clock. It's the <laughs> clock. The clock really helps. So the next question goes first to Jim and then to Charles. Yeah. And these are questions that came out of uh, those of you who are gathered with us tonight. It's been said that the city of Cornerbrook is unfriendly toward business and business development. How would you respond to this? So, Jim, two minutes. Well, uh, among other things, uh, I mean, I'm a business consultant. Uh, I've worked in the IT industry for about 19 years. Um, I am currently the chair of the Downtown Business Association, and I speak with businesses uh, every day. Um, they tell me that businesses, it's hard to do business with City Hall. Um, I talk to contractors, they tell me it's hard to do business with City Hall. I talk to engineering firms, and they tell me it's hard to do business with City Hall. If you look at um, some of the uh, rhetoric that comes out of City Hall, you would uh, think, oh no, there's nothing wrong. Oh, just absolutely, not. everything's great. Oh, we permits out the door just like that. Well, where's the disconnect? If there, is a, uh, if there is a problem, perception may be part of it, but perception is reality when it comes to doing business. So what have we done to address uh, that perception? Uh, and I think a big part of that is connection. I don't think that, I don't think that City Hall acts as a facilitator to business. I believe it acts as a regulator. It's about what you can't do. Oh, you can't do it that way, you can't do it that way. But there's never the follow-up, which is, but you could do it this way, and we can help you do it that way. And I think we gotta start understanding our bigger purpose as a city. And our bigger purpose as a city is to see development here for our citizens. Great, thanks, Jim. Charles, uh, once we get, do you want the question again, or you? Yes, please. No, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. She, she's moving it back here, back and forth. Yeah. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, so it's been said that the city of Cornerbrook is done friendly toward business and business development. How would you respond to this? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, perception takes a long time to change, and you can't uh, please everyone all the time. So there's always going to be blips along the way. But over the last four years, uh, we've introduced a number of new measures and uh, new programs to encourage business. I speak with businesses every day. I work with business all the time. When I uh, first got elected to council, I think I counted 13 empty buildings in the city. Now, of those 13, there are two. All of the other ones are either renovated or filled with new businesses or under renovation currently uh, with millions of dollars in new business. We have new car dealerships. 
we have new housing developments, and we're working on a couple new hotels. So there's lots of business going on. Small business usually finds it difficult with working with regulations. Many of the regulations that we have in place are regulations that are under the Urban Rural Planning Act, which is a provincial law, which we can't break. There are other regulations that we're obligated to follow through uh, different kinds of uh, federal organization so we have an obligation to follow those whether it's an environmental regulation if you buy an old building that's contaminated you have to clean it and so on so a lot of people see regulations as a block or a red tape or whatever regulations are also there to protect people uh, a few years ago we had somebody buy an older building and they were about to purchase it they came and got a tax certificate from the city our inspectors went over and looked at it as we normally do and realized that they had removed a main supporting beam in that building some years prior to and that that building if it was used for the purpose that the new owners intended that the roof would have collapsed on possibly the resident the customers and, and the people working there so regulations are there for a reason they're making sure that you don't get flooded that you don't get polluted uh, there's all kinds of reasons that they're there realizing that of course we also have hired a business facilitator who is uh, apt uh, uh, very engaged in the community open business recently. Uh, most of our permits are dealt with 44% uh, in one day. 90% uh, of them are done, uh, dealt with in about three days. The reason why you don't get a permit any quicker or some people are delayed is sometimes they need engineering reports, they need other things, and they haven't provided it to the city, which means that we have to wait until they provide the information. Great. Thank you, Charles. Sure. Uh, Jim, you have one minute? minute. Okay, okay, I just want to just... just I, 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 the mayor mentioned a few a uh, few things like the how long it takes to change perception is 20 years too long I mean mr. Pender has been in office for 20 years at City Hall um, vacant buildings two vacant buildings I uh, we at the Downtown Business Association have a registry of vacant properties uh, go to downtowncornerbrook.com slash available real estate and you'll find more than two zoning the IMSP was done in 2012. A lot of the regulations that uh, I mean, the mayor just mentioned, it is cumbersome to go and change zoning regulations. It's done that way on purpose. You plan a city and then you try to work within that plan. That plan was done in 2012, uh, 2012 five years ago. It's due for a replacement. Now, in terms of cutting red tape, there's been a lot of talk about cutting red tape. I don't know of any regulation that's been changed or cut. There's been talk of a, uh, um, a business advisory committee. Uh, I haven't met a counselor or a staff member or myself as chair of the DBA that, sorry, thank you, that knows <laughs> such a thing. So, okay. Uh, so, Charles, you have. Yeah, so, a minute and one second. Okay. So I've only been in. Uh, I've only been mayor for four years. I've been in council over. 20 years for 14 of those 20, so not 20 years. And uh, we do have business incentives. We have the business improvement program. We have a number of businesses taking advantage of that now, which is a tax incentive. We also have a tax grant program to encourage businesses to take over abandoned buildings that have been abandoned for more than 12 uh, months. Uh, the buildings that I mentioned, I said there was two of the 13 that were there when I came into office. There may be others now because people do uh, shut down and reopen businesses. But at, at the end of the day, there's always going to be issues that we have to overcome. That's what working with the business community, listening to the Board of Trade and other business representatives and individual business owners means. That's how we get things changed. It's slow. It takes time. We can't break regulations and bend regulations overnight. Things have to change uh, with, uh, I guess, respect to how you impact the other people in the community that your change of regulations uh, will have, I guess. So we have to be careful of how we do things. We have to move forward, but we can't change everything overnight either. Excellent. Thank you. Good answer. Um, mm. Top up, anybody? Please. Okay. Drying. So that's uh, it is it is dry in here. We can't afford uh, humidification anymore. We have some cuts. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> humidification. Oh, that's okay. That's Can okay. we get? That's good enough. That's good enough. This is anyway. We'll get some more for you in just a moment. So that's three questions down. We have three more questions to go. Um, the fourth question here, and Charles will start, okay. and then Jim. Charles, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get you more water just before. Just. Wanna, of course, we're going to need a bathroom right? break after this. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've had to close those down, too. Who needs yeah, that? That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little memo went out. You go to the bathroom before you come into work. Oh, darn. Yeah, I think it's forgot to say. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh. It's coming. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, the fourth question here, starting with Charles, then. 
Please explain your understanding of the importance of the arts to Cornerbrook and how will you further support the development of the arts here? Charles. So uh, my family's always been involved with the arts. My kids, Thomas and Marie, have been heavily involved in theater, music, and all those types of things. And as an educator, I always supported the arts in, in the community. Uh, one of the things I'm proudest of, of course, is our professional artists uh, through Theater Newfoundland Labrador, Grossmore Summer Theater with the former Stage West and so on, and our uh, other uh, artist groups out there, off-Broadway players and others. that. Individuals who uh, perform or uh, do visual arts. Uh, we have uh, a beautiful facility in the city of Cornerbrook uh, at the Rotary Arts Centre, uh, a wonderful addition to the uh, Cornerbrook City Hall that I've supported right from the very beginning and made sure that uh, we've done everything we can to accommodate the uh, Rotary Arts Centre and to support them in their good works. And uh, it's really uh, proven to be a great benefit to the city, both to visual artists, to practicing artists in the studios that they have there, the art gallery that's there, and of course the uh, Anthony Theatre. Very proud of that uh, in our community. We also support uh, other activities such as the Sounds of Summer that's been going on for 10 or 11 years now. This year we recently had the West Fest Festival, just something that we tried to see if we could do a waterfront festival. Our Cornerbrook Festival, we always hire um, and pay actually our local artists, uh, especially our young talent that uh, perform uh, so admirably for us. My big uh, thing would be to, uh, I think in the future, to look at establishing a task force on the arts, culture, and heritage to uh, engage those who know best uh, what is needed in the community. How do we go about not only pr uh, promoting but supporting and ensuring that the artistic community in our community uh, in Cornerbrook have the opportunity to do their utmost and their best. There's a whole uh, opportunity here in the tourism market, the marketing conventions uh, segment and so on, where uh, the arts are extremely important. And we can't forget Get not only the cultural part but the economic advantage of having all of these uh, wonderful and amazing artists in our community. So I've always been a strong supporter and I will continue to be a strong supporter and I would uh, look forward to reaching out to the artistic community to work with them and see what we need to do to support them better. Thanks. Jim, so it's please explain your understanding of the importance of the arts at Cornerbrook and how will you further support the development of the arts. I think uh, I think the arts is um, you know it's it's an important um, quality of life issue, it's an important economic issue, but it's also I think an important identity issue for Cornerbrook. Um, many of you may know that I've been involved in the arts, well since I was a kid here. Uh, you may have seen me on stage at the Arts and Culture Center. You may have seen me on Rogers. Uh, doing those funny commercials. Um, a lot of people know me that way. Um, but uh, I've been uh, also on the administrative side of the arts. I've been the chair of Theatre Newfoundland Labrador. Uh, I'm on, I was on the board of Grossmore and Summer Music. And I know from their perspective uh, the struggle to uh, make sure you can fund uh, your program and put it on stage and provide employment to hundreds of people in our province and on the West Coast. Um, I think, uh, I also of course own Swirsky's on Broadway. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's a licensed theater and music hall. So uh, I believe in the arts so much I put my money where my mouth is. Um, when it comes to the arts, I think that the city has a portent, uh, an important coordination role. Um, I think the mayor has uh, mentioned that he's looking at a, um, a mayor's task force on the arts. I'm not sure it's a task force. I don't think we need to fix the arts, but I think we do need to coordinate with artists of all types uh, and uh, look at it from a um, both, like I said, a quality of life and identity issue, but also economically. Let's see how the arts can fit into a revived tourism product because that's something we need to work on and we need the help from the arts community. Thanks. Charles, uh, let's get the computer a minute. Yeah, I've only appeared on stage twice, uh, once in a Mumbles production and last year in TNL's uh, Christmas show, and I, I don't want anybody to remember that, so I'll just leave that there. Um, but uh, I, as I said, I've been a big supporter of the arts uh, all my life uh, and uh, with our kids uh, involved in the arts and our family. Uh, my, my family's very musical, and we've always been involved with that and supporting it. And uh, as I said, with the Rotary Arts, 
Center. I, I don't own a, a, an arts center or whatever, but I can guarantee you that uh, the City of Cornerbrook uh, does support the arts, it funds the arts. We fund uh, different organizations and events and so on, and uh, I would continue to do that. When I talk about a task force on the arts, what I'm saying is that there are people out there who know better what to do than I or many people on our council or even in City Hall. So we need to listen to those people, sit down with them, work with them, and look at how we can benefit from their expertise, both culturally economically and contribute to the quality of life that we have right here in Cornerbrook. Great, thanks. And Jim, you have a minute? As soon as yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think that's right. I think City Hall does have to reach out and learn from the arts community. Um, again, we can do that in the future, I guess. We have been doing it. Um, there's a time, that, there's, a, there's a, I guess, a role for the city to start connecting with various parts of our community. Uh, one specific sort of thing I wanted to mention was uh, the city is, uh, of course, gives a number of community investment grants every year, and that's about, uh, about a quarter million dollars. Uh, that money, I guess, is very important to many of the arts organizations and artists. And uh, I'd like to bring, I know the struggle. When I was with TNL, I know every year it'd be like, okay, are we going to get our you know, 3000 or $5,000 or whatever. Uh, I'd like to bring a little more, I guess, consistency and transparency to the process for who gets those grants. Uh, so that's one thing I'd like to do for the arts, but I agree with the mayor. I think we should reach out more to the arts community and consult with them more. Thanks, so we can to both for that round. Question number five, and we'll start, Jim, you get to go first, and then Charles, and Jim and Charles. A recent Harris Center report projects significant changes in the demographics of the Cornerbrook region. A 17% decrease in population and an increase in the average age from 44 to 50 by the year 2036. If I'm only 50 in 2036, I'd be happy, but anyways, that's beside the point. How will we continue to provide services to a smaller, aging population in this projected scenario and what we sh should we be doing now? Well, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I know it's not something uh, that was a big topic of discussion in the earlier uh, candidates' uh, messages. I know a couple of you uh, mentioned it. Um, that's weighing very heavily on me. Um, when we launched back in May, uh, some of you may have been there, some of you may have seen the speech. It's on our website if you want to read it. Uh, but this was something that we took note of. We are in a crisis situation. We cannot do nothing anymore. We will not have a tax base to support the lifestyle that we're used to. Now, I know that sounds scary, but we can do things. We can right this ship, but we need all hands on deck. We need all parts of our economy working together. We need Grenfell, we need the mill, we need the business community, we need our voluntary sector, we need, we need our port. Uh, we need to sort of build our economy as a means to build our population. And if we don't take action, we, cannot, we will not be able to afford uh, to plow our roads or uh, to have our clean water, our wonderful water. Um, I know it sounds dire, but it's not. We can take action. The problem is we do not even have an economic development plan right now. Believe it or not, us as a city, we don't have that plan. But we can be the spark of innovation here. We can bring Grenfell together. We, we have research capabilities here that are amazing. We have a slew of you know, international students that could come in here. We have a number of young sort of Newfoundlanders that are skilled. They could be the spark for our new economy. But we need to get out there and talk to our business community, talk to the mill, talk to the, uh, talk to the hospital. We need to collaborate. We just can't set the environment anymore and hope that business comes. It's not going to happen. Thanks. Uh, the question again, a recent Harris Center report, significant changes in the demographics of the Cornerbrook region, 17% decrease, average age will go up to 50 by 2036. How will we continue to provide services to a smaller aging population in this projected scenario? What we, should we be doing now? 
So thank you. Uh, yeah, obviously it's a, a serious situation that has been uh, afflicting the province for the last uh, 20 or 30 years since, I guess, the collapse in the fishery. And even though we've seen the boom times of the oil on the East Coast, we haven't seen it on the West Coast. It's not only the West Coast that's been affected, Central and Northern Peninsula are affected even worse, uh, according to the uh, Harris report. Uh, we are talking with uh, the mill, we are talking with the hospital, we're working with the province. A new hospital here will bring several thousand jo construction jobs to start. Uh, once it's built a new cancer care or treatment in that hospital, we create new jobs as well. But that's government money, that's our tax dollars that are being recycled. So we need to look at opportunities to bring in money from offshore. Uh, Barry's Fishery is looking at uh, going after redfish in the next couple of years that will create a number of jobs in the Bay of Islands that we'll, we will see spin off from. That will be a long term resort. Uh, industry that will see some uh, benefit here in Cornerbrook. Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper is also working with other products that they can develop in their mill that brings in money offshore from the United States and other areas. We have actually two of the largest uh, industries right here in our own uh, bay with uh, both forestry and fishery and they're extremely important to us in the future. Another opportunity we have is uh, Biothic Energy that has one billion dollars sitting there of uh, Danish pension funds that is uh, to either be expended by the end of this year, or at least start, or it will go away. They have a, a very significant project, a wind energy fabrication facility right here in the Bay of Islands. We're working with the Cornerbrook Port Corporation, and the Cornerbrook Port Corporation is moving forward with their plans to get ready for that industry. Uh, we should see an RFD on that in the next number of weeks. We're talking with the Cornerbrook uh, Greater Board of Trade. We work with all industries, all segments of the uh, government and different uh, parts of the economy to look at where are those opportunities. One of the biggest opportunities, of course, because uh, they hire the most people are small businesses in this community as well. All of those people bring jobs. Jobs will bring people. And that's how we can look at how do we improve the economy and the population in the future. Thank you. Jim, uh, a minute? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the mayor that um, we do need to uh, look to uh, look to other parts of our community to help us with this. I can't find evidence that we're doing that. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe it. We reduced our business tax rate last budget by the smallest amount possible. We've reduced it from 17 mills to 16.75 mills. That's a 1.4% reduction. If we expect that to spur growth, we're kidding ourselves. Um, we need to do things like eliminate the poll tax. If we're going to attract young people here and young families here, how can, they, how can we expect to have them here when we send them the message, no, no, we don't want you here. We don't want you to sort of uh, uh, rent an apartment and take a job here. We're one of the only places in Canada that has this. Uh, it, it's wrong. Um, we need to lead a regional solution for this as well, and I think we need to work on better cooperation with our partners. Thank you. So recently in talking about regional solutions, I've met with the mayors of Port of Bass, Steve Mill and Deer Lake uh, and uh, representatives of the port and uh, Biathic Energy to draw the attention of the importance of this uh, potential uh, development here in Cornerbrook that could bring anywhere from 600 to 2,000 jobs, which would, uh, you know, change uh, the face not only of Cornerbrook but the West Coast. So we've done that and uh, we've got the province's attention finally on that. Uh, with the regard to, you know, poll tax, uh, it takes at least four people on a council to willingly give up the poll tax, which is about $400,000. Uh, we've eliminated it for students by increasing the credits for students uh, so that they don't have to pay a poll tax. And if you have a bail bill, you should be down telling the city that you're a student. Uh, for uh, other people who live in uh, unincorporated areas like Little Rapids and places like that uh, who make good salaries, they also pay a poll tax to Cornerbrook if they're not paying a pr uh, property tax in their community. And that represents somewhere around a quarter to uh, one third of the taxes that we collect. Great, thanks. So uh, we can to focus on this round, right? Okay. Hmm? I had a crisis of confidence. I thought, are we done with that We're question sure, or was yeah. I supposed to go? Yeah. So if your question is not one of the ones that are asked, uh, everybody's sort of sticking around. So you can certainly ask that question afterward. We've chosen some questions that are uh, reflective of the clusters of issues that came up. And so the sixth question, which Charles will begin with, and then Jim, 
is around finances. Uh, the city must have a balanced budget. The current budget is about $35 million, a debt service fee of about 17% of the budget. So the question is, with the commitments being made for infrastructure, like pool, baseball field, arts, additional staff, reducing uh, poll tax and so on, how do you see balancing the budget for 2018? And so we start with Charles. Yeah, so we do have to have a balanced budget. We're required to do that. It's about 34 million now. Of that 34 million, about 25 million goes to operations. Uh, then we had debt servicing, both for us and on behalf of the province, and uh, some other costs. So that's about uh, the money that we collect, not only from residents. So businesses, businesses pay about five million of the twenty-five million that we collect in, in uh, revenues from taxes, property, and business tax, and so on. Um, we uh, also, um, I guess, uh, lay out a ten-year plan for infrastructure and for boring, so that we know exactly how much money we're going to need over the long term. We're about seventeen percent debt servicing. The uh, highest ratio that you can have in the province legally is thirty percent. So we're well within the uh, the range that is permissible by the province. As well, uh, I guess uh, over the last number of years, I think I've demonstrated through my experience and my leadership that I've been able to successfully uh, go to the federal and provincial governments to find funding. Uh, we've accumulated in the last two years alone over $20 million in federal and provincial funding. They pay about 70% of projects. We pick up the other 30%. Most of it is related to necessary infrastructure, water, sewer, like you're seeing the $10 million program. We're doing in Cobb Lane, Ellswick Road, and next year on West Valley. Uh, you'll see other projects that we do with our water and, and our sewer systems. We are currently uh, looking at our uh, sewage treatment facility that we hope to build in the near future when the federal money comes. So it's all about being able to uh, navigate, being able to understand the funding programs that are out there, whether they're federal government, provincial government, agencies like ACOA or uh, the provincial agencies that are out there. There's lots of pots of money. Recently we got $40,000 just to to put new doors into our city hall to make them more accessible and crossing signals at crossing lights because some people can't see the light across the road and they need audible signals. So there's all kinds of ways to find funding. Uh, our challenge is to find it and not exceed our capacity to pay. We haven't raised taxes in four years, yet we've been able to accumulate over $20 million in infrastructure spending and there's more to come. Great, thank you. So this is about the balanced budget. The budget's around 34 million, 17% of the budget is debt sur uh, service. With the commitments being made for infrastructure, pool, baseball field, and so on, and reducing revenue like poll tax, how do you see balancing the budget for 2018? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that the mayor is right that we do, to a large extent, have to rely on our provincial and federal government counterparts for capital spending. Uh, I'm not hearing any solutions, actually. I'm not, I didn't hear any plan there to increase revenue to offset uh, expenses like we're talking about a new regional aquatic facility that may cost us upward of three quarters or a million dollars a year to operate. Um, or sewage treatment. We don't know how much that's going to cost us to operate when it's finally built. Uh, and it is a federally mandated uh, uh, thing that we have to do. Um, businesses pay, I think, closer to $6.2 million uh, toward our revenues right now. Me as a small business owner on Swirsky's, at the beginning of the year, I get I own my property. I pay 12.5 mills at the begin if for property tax, and another 17 or sorry 16.75 mills on top of that. So for my property, it ends up being about $7,200 before I make a sale. If you're a small business owner, that's horrifying. Um, you talk about sort of attracting new business for small businesses. That's horrifying. We need to change that. We need to take a long-term approach to economic development. The current council inherited a 28% increase from the previous council on property taxes. And they pride themselves on not having had to raise property tax. That's great in the short term, and it's great to be able to find other sources of revenue. We need to find other sources of revenue. We need to grow business, and that's how we have to offset our incoming expenses. Great. Thank you, Jim. I'll get the computer turned around, and Charles uh, wants to get that. Yes, yeah, so uh, any operation of a new aquatics facility would be a regional facility. So we've uh, negotiated with communities around us. The provincial government has already said that on top of whatever the federal government pays for the um, uh, capital cost, they will contribute up to 70% of that additional. So we're looking at about 30% of a, maybe a 24 or $30 million billing mortgaged over 10 years. 
between a number of communities. So that's the capital side. The operational side would be uh, similar to that. So it would be a user group or a committee that would be set up to organize that, either of communities or outside agencies. Um, with uh, respect to sewage treatment, we do know it's going to cost about $1.5 million. We've done all the work on it. We've visited other sewage treatment facilities around the Atlantic provinces. Uh, we've hired CBCL, who are currently now working on the actual design of that facility. Uh, we know the equipment. We know where it's going to go. We know those things. So we're just working through that right now. Uh, business taxes, you know, yes, we did, uh, we did inherit 28%, uh, but we've also reduced uh, a lot of internal expenses. And my commitment has always been to do better with what we have. And we've been doing that through uh, reorganizing City Hall and, and other tools that we've done uh, or used, I guess, to reduce our expenditures. Okay, thanks. And for our last uh, response for tonight, I guess, Jim, you get a minute there. Yeah, I mean, I guess generally I think that, uh, again, we don't have a solution to right our fiscal ship. We've got a housing market that's becoming very soft very quickly because we have a lot of older citizens moving into condos and apartments. And there's a lot of, I know on the west side where I'm from, there's a lot of for sale signs. People aren't buying those houses, their value is decreasing. Our, that means the taxes we take based on those assessed values are going down. We need to look, we have to take a fundamentally new approach to developing our economy if we want to write city halls fiscal situation, let alone our city's economic situation and population situation. So I think it's time for some um, serious consideration of a, an economic development plan that encompasses the whole city, the whole community. How about a big, bigger hand for... <laughs> And that's, I guess you guys can go back. That's the last question, right? You're done. Pee break? You were just getting started. Pee break now, yeah. <laughs> Two things. One is, uh, what are you going to do on Tuesday? <sighs> like, that's really, that's really Presbyterian, that is, you know? What are you going to do on Tuesday? Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that's a little bit better. And all of these people who came out, both those running for council and for mayor, again, to have people running in your community f to help to run the community is very important for us. And it's great to see so many people who are willing to put themselves forward. And I think they deserve a token, at least, in a huge round of applause for all of those. <laughs> So now you can go out, you can talk to any of these, uh, chat with them, ask them your question. There's, uh, s there's some coffee and tea out there and so on. And thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. Was it too painful? No, the timer thing's great. The yeah, time, you both really these well. guys were really yeah. on. Like it was like. Hey, you glance at it every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that worked. That was perfect. It was. <laughs>